Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Last time we saw that if you have a matrix um, A uh, over a field, an M by N matrix with entries in a field F, then uh, A is equivalent to a unique matrix of the form 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0. And uh, this number of 1s here is uh, the rank of A. And I gave you an algorithm for doing this. Basically, you reduce A to a matrix with non-zero entries on the diagonal, and then you can scale those diagonal entries um, to be 1 and zeros everywhere else. Now, this time we are going to see what happens if we change this field F to a ring R. Well, let's say a commutative ring. But to start with, uh, let's see what happens when we take a Euclidean domain. Um, later, we will replace it by a slightly more general case of what happens when you take R to be a principal ideal domain. In that case, uh, the canonical form is not so simple. It's not just uh, determined by an integer R, which is the rank. It's, it's a bit more complicated. And this canonical form is called the Smith canonical form. So this lecture is called Smith canonical form or sometimes called Smith normal form. So what it says is that instead of a bunch of ones you will have entries d1, d2, dr along the diagonal such that the ideal of d1 or maybe I'll just write it in terms of divisibility d1 divides d2 divides d3 all the way up to divides dr um, uh, or in other words we can say that the ideal of d1 contains the ideal of d2 contains the ideal of dr and uh, moreover this is not exactly unique it's only that these ideals are unique so um, so this form is unique up to uh, the choice of ideals generated by d1, d2, dr. So let me state it more formally. Theorem. Let R be a Euclidean domain. Then every matrix A with entries in R is equivalent to a matrix of the form D1 DR 0 0 for some r less than or equal to minimum of m and n in fact uh, where the ideal generated by d1 contains the ideal generated by d2 contains the ideal generated by dr and this form is unique up to multiplying these uh, entries d1, d2, dr by units. So these ideals are uniquely determined by A. And uh, so I'll prove this in two parts. Firstly, I'll show that you can start with any matrix of a Euclidean domain and then uh, reduce it to a Smith canonical form. And then I'll show that this Smith canonical form is essentially unique. 
The first part will proceed as in the last lecture. I'll I'll give you an algorithm. Okay, so before uh, we begin to uh, study this algorithm, let's just uh, recall what a Euclidean domain is. So recall that a Euclidean domain R comes with a size function. And this function, which we usually denote by d, goes from r to the set, um, let's say, non-negative integers. And it has the property that for all m n in r, if m is not 0, there exist q and r in r such that uh, n is equal to q m plus r and d r is strictly less than d m or r is equal to 0. So either m divides n or you can subtract a multiple of m from n to get a remainder whose uh, size is strictly smaller than the size of m. And an important feature here is that the values that the size function can take are non-negative integers. So if you uh, have some sort of algorithm where at each step you strictly decrease the size, then that algorithm has to stop after a finite number of steps. And that is something that we are going to take advantage of time and again in today's lecture. So let me give you the proof of Smith canonical form. So it's really an algorithm. So uh, the algorithm will uh, proceed by an induction step. So the main loop of the algorithm, so to speak, is an induction step. So the induction step says that A is similar to a matrix of the form D1, 0, 0, 0, here in the first row, 0, 0 in the first column, except for this first entry and then another matrix A prime where D1 divides all the entries of A prime. Once we do this induction step, uh, we can repeat it on the sub matrix A prime and uh, when we do row and column operations only on the sub matrix A prime, it will not affect the first row of A or the first column of A. And so we can proceed inductively till this matrix that we get, the smaller sub matrix becomes 0 or you know the matrix A itself is exhausted and we will definitely end up with a Smith canonical form. So firstly, okay, so here is the algorithm, uh, if A is 0, then you are done, right? do nothing, okay? but otherwise uh, by interchanging rows and columns, can assume that A11 is not equal to 0. Because there will be some non-zero entry somewhere in A. You just by interchanging rows, you move it up to the first row and then by interchanging columns, you move it to the one one place. Now what I want to do is try to clear off the remaining entries of the first row, the first column. Now if uh, A1j is uh, not equal to 0 for some j, then one of two things can happen. Either a1j equals qa11 plus r where uh, r is equal to 0 or the other thing that can happen is dr is less than da11. Okay. So now if 
r is equal to 0 so what we have is q uh, a 1 j equals q a 1 1 right that's what we are saying so then what we can do is so so we have this uh, a 1 1 here we have a bunch of stuff here and we have a 1 j here and uh, so this is our matrix and we have some stuff here I don't really care so if r equals 0 what you do is you perform the column operation cj goes to cj minus q c1 so what will happen is that we will take this entry and subtract q times a11 from it and so this will now become 0 and so we will get a1j becomes 0. If r is not 0 then you still do the same operation you do cj goes to cj minus qc1 and now instead of 0 you get r here and uh, then what you do is you interchange the jth column and the first column. So now what happens is that this r comes over here and the a11 comes over here. So what we have is that uh, at this point we have reduced the value of v a11 so this is r is the new a11 so every time uh, there is a non zero element in the first row of um, of a um, beyond this except for in the first column what we can do is we can either kill it or we can reduce the sorry d we can reduce the size of the 1 1 th entry of A by performing two column operations. So this process of reducing the size of um, D A 1 uh, reducing the size of A 1 1 cannot continue indefinitely because at some point you will reach uh, the smallest possible size and the process will have to stop you cannot reduce it any below 0. And so the conclusion is that after finitely many steps we would have cleared out all the entries in the first row except for the first uh, one one entry so after finitely many steps this process must stop resulting in something like this a11000 0, 0, 0, and whatever over here okay now let's try to clear the first column we can do exactly the same kind of thing to try to clear the first column um, and um, instead of just instead of uh, column operations will be doing row operations and uh, that process too must stop in finitely many steps. So we can try to get here 0 0 0 but not so fast the problem is that in trying to get 0 0 0 here we may have messed up these entries these may have become non zero so now we are back to square one the rows are now non zero the entries in the first row are now non zero but no matter we again uh, work with the rows and try to make them zero in the process well we may turn the column entries non zero so what is the way out of this the way out of this is the fact that each time we do this 
we are further reducing d of a11 so this may in turn uh, disturb the entries a12 to a1 and making them non zero but the point is each time we have a non zero entry in the first row or in the first column uh, we are able to do these row or column operations which strictly decrease the size of a11 so this process too must stop after finitely many steps so then go back to um, let's call this step something go back to Uh, reducing the entries of the first row to zero. This process again, since each time d of a11 decreases strictly. this process too must stop this process namely of uh, you know trying to make the first row zero then trying to make the first column zero then trying to make the first row zero and so on must stop in finitely many steps so we have succeeded after finitely many steps we would have succeeded in getting a to the form a one one zero 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 and some matrix A prime. But we wanted that A one one divides A prime, all the entries of A prime. So if A one one divides all entries of A prime, then induction step is complete. Otherwise, uh, there exists some entry a prime k l such that a one one does not divide a prime k l. So what we have is that somewhere in this mess we have this entry a prime k l. And we have all kinds of stuff over here, and this entry a prime k l is such that a one one, it's not divisible by a one one. So what you can do is now you can just do say r one goes to r one plus r k. So what will happen is that that will bring this entry a prime k l up here, and it will also mess up the rest of the first row. Okay, but then what you can do is you can again apply the Euclidean algorithm. So, a prime k l is q times a one one plus r, where d of r is strictly less than d of a one one. So, what you do is you do um, um, c l goes to c l minus q c one. And then you do um, C1 interchanged with CL. After you've done this, what will happen is that this R would have come here. Oops. And uh, oops. R would have come here. And of course, we don't know what mess we have over here. We don't really care. The point is. That this d of r is again strictly less than d a one one, so it's like the game is like this. We keep trying to achieve this um, induction step, this matrix a, uh, this form uh, d one zero 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 a prime, where d divides d one divides all the entries of a prime. But 
each time we uh, try to get do that but each time we fail to do that what we can do is we can do some steps to strictly reduce the um, size of d1 of the size of a11 and so after finitely many steps we can no longer reduce the size of a11 so after repeating this whole process so we are back to square one in some sense now we need to clear out the entries of the first row uh, then clear out the entries of the first column which might disturb the first row and so on but this whole big process now we keep repeating and after finitely many steps of this kind we get a matrix of the form d1 a prime 0 0 0 0 0 0 where d1 divides all the entries of a prime. Now if d1 divides all the entries of a prime uh, and now you perform row and column operations on a prime d1 will continue to divide divide all the entries of the transformed matrices um, of the transformed matrix uh, a prime so when you now further take this a prime and apply this induction step to it at the next stage you'll get d2 and then you'll get 0 0 0 here 0 0 0 here and you'll get a matrix a2 D1 will divide all the entries of this matrix D2000 A2 and so D1 will divide D2 and then when you apply it to A2 you will get D3 and so on. So continuing in this manner results in a Smith canonical form. Let us now address the uniqueness of the Smith canonical form. Suppose I have two matrices. Uh, the first is A, D1, D2, DR, 0, 0, 0, and B is E1, E2, ES, 0, 0, 0. And suppose I know that A is equivalent to B. Then I want to show that the ideal um, generated by DI is equal to the ideal generated by EI for I equals 1 to R and R is actually equal to S. It's easier to just show um, that the ideal generated by D1 is equal to the ideal generated by E1. Why is that? So let's denote by parentheses A the ideal generated by all the entries of the matrix A. Now suppose we have that B is equal to G A H then what does that mean that means that each entry of B is given by a sum of entries G um, I K A K L H L J so where we will be summing over K and L over appropriate indices so the entries of B are of this form which means that certainly all the entries of B belong to the ideal generated by the entries of A, which implies that the ideal generated by the entries of B are contained in the ideal generated by, is contained in the ideal generated by the entries of A. Now, if A and B are actually equivalent, then these matrices G and H are invertible. So then I can write, then we can take um, A as the form G prime 
B H prime for some matrices G prime and H prime may be the inverses of G and H if they were invertible and so we get that the ideal generated by A would be contained in the ideal generated by B. Putting these together we get that the ideal generated by the entries of A is equal to the ideal generated by the entries of B. Now let's go back and look at these two matrices in a Smith canonical form. Clearly the ideal generated by the entries of A is well the ideal generated by D1, D2, uh, D3 and so on and uh, I forgot to mention we have the additional condition that the ideal generated by D1 contains the ideal generated by D2 and so on and the ideal generated by E1 contains the ideal generated by E2 and so on which means that the ideal generated by the entries of A is D1 and the ideal generated by the entries of B is D2. So the ideal generated by A is D1, ideal generated ideal generated by D1 and the ideal generated by B is the ideal generated by E1. So this implies that if A is equivalent to B then the ideal generated by E1 is equal to the ideal generated by D1. So this proves a uh, part of the assertion of the uniqueness of Smith canonical form. How are we going to show that the ideal generated by D2 and E2 are the same for example. So uh, we will use the following lemma. Um, the ideal generated by, so, so let A be a matrix of the form D1, D2, DR, 0, 0, 0. So it's in a Smith canonical form. Then the ideal generated by k by k minus of a is the ideal generated by the product d1 d2 dk. Well, this is not at all difficult to prove. Uh, the point is that the only non-zero minors of this matrix are going to be uh, the minors where you choose the same rows as you choose the columns and in that case um, the determinant is just going to be the product of the diagonal entries in those rows and columns. So the all k by k minors of A are either 0 or of the form d i 1 d i k where i 1 less than i k and so uh, since the ideal generated by d 1 contains the ideal generated by d 2 and so on the largest of all these ideals is the ideal generated by this product is just going to be the one where you take the largest ideals. Okay. Now with this in mind we can uh, show that um, if A is equivalent to B then the ideal generated by k by k minors of A is equal to k by k minors of P. Let us use this notation A subscript round bracket subscript k to denote the ideal generated by k by k minus of a. Now recall from the lecture on uh, tensor algebras and exterior algebras that um, wedge k a has as entries the k by k 
minors of a. So this matrix corresponding to wedge k of a on the x kth exterior power um, has as entries k by k minors of a. Um, we did that for um, square matrices, uh, no, for, for matrices over a, uh, over a field, but it works equally well over a ring. And um, so what we have is that uh, a k is just the end ideal generated by the entries of wedge k a. So now if a is equivalent to b, then we have b is equal to g a h for some matrix g in g l m r and h in g l n r. And likewise, we also have, we saw that um, the exterior powers, they compose nicely. So, wedge k b is wedge k g composed with wedge k a composed with wedge k h. And this implies that the ideal generated by the entries of wedge k b is contained in the ideal generated by the entries of wedge k a. And by symmetry you get that these ideals are equal. Therefore, a k You actually get the equality, and therefore a k is equal to wedge k a, which is equal to wedge k b, which is b k. So the ideal generated by k by k minors of a has to be equal to the ideal generated by k by k minors of b. And now let's go back and look at our matrices in Smith canonical form. The ideal generated by k by k minors of A is exactly d1, d2, dr, uh, dk. And so what we get is that if A which is d1, dr is equivalent to B E1, ES, um, then D1, DR, the ideal generated with these guys, is equal to E1, ES. Uh, E1, sorry, e D1, DK is equal to the ideal generated by E1, EK for all and uh, once you go beyond R, both these have to be 0. And so R is going to be equal to S, already we see that. And uh, so what this means is that firstly D1 is some unit times D1, D1, D2 is some other unit times E2, D1, D2, D3 is some other unit, uh, sorry, times E1, E2 some other unit times e1, e2, e3 and using these uh, using these um, identities you can also show that d1 is some unit times e1, uh, d2 is some unit may be different from this times e2 and so on. Inductively. So for example uh, what we have is um, d1 d2 is u2 e1 e2 but what we know is that e1 is u1 inverse d1 so u1 inverse d1 and now in an euclidean domain you can cancel so this means that d2 is some unit u2 u1 inverse e2 which means that the ideal generated by d2 is equal to the ideal generated by e2 and so on. So this proves the uniqueness of the Smith canonical form. Mm -hmm.